scripture tonight. Here are the words of the Lord. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James. Then all continued with one accord. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. We looked this morning at Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through, 12, uh, 1 through 11 rather where we saw the very genesis of the local New Testament church. The same thing that we still are to this day, a local New Testament church. And we saw the final moments that the disciples, the apostles and the, the, those that were following Christ had with him before he ascended into heaven and basically in verse 11, they get the kickstart from the angels that appear after Jesus ascends that tells them to, what are you staring at? There is work to be done. And this is the very next thing that the apostles go about doing. I call it the scripture had to be fulfilled. They had to first come to grips with what they were dealing with and what had happened. Because what had happened was, was a pretty traumatic thing for these uh, disciples. You got to imagine... I don't know if any of you went when the Passion of the Christ movie came out some years ago. I know a lot of churches were, were going in droves, and I remember going myself, and I remember sitting in a movie theater watching this depiction, and I, and I think they did a real good job with it uh, as, as far as accuracy and everything. And I just I remember seeing you know just grown men and grown women just bawling, just crying, just just just, and and we're only seeing it on the screen. You imagine. Uh, the witnesses of Christ that were at his crucifixion, standing there watching him be beaten and watching him be crucified and watching him go through this painful and terrible death. And it's an awful thing to see. But at the crux of all of it is the question that the, uh, the apostles rather were faced with. And that was the inconvenient fact that the scripture had to be fulfilled. It had to be fulfilled. No matter how much it hurt no matter how much pain and sorrow and anger was felt, the scripture had to be fulfilled because the scripture is God's word. And God, in his, one of his many ways he reveals himself to us is through fulfilling prophecy. When God's word says it is going to happen and it comes true and it comes forward, you see the hand of God working and you see that this was the word of God speaking and that this had to be fulfilled because God said it had to be fulfilled. But it becomes very inconvenient for us. When scripture or prophecy becomes inconvenient for us, or we don't like what it says, we have two choices. We can either run away in denial, or we can accept that God's plan is bigger than us. And that's and, and it's, it's tough to do. Even Simon Peter didn't get it right. Simon Peter told Jesus he would, he would never leave him. He told Jesus that he would, he would never leave his side. No matter who fell away, Peter said, I will never leave you. And Jesus had to pull him in close and say, you are going to deny me three times. And you got to imagine Peter's heart just had to drop. Like, Why are you saying this to me? And it came fulfilled. And he just, he ran away weeping because the scripture had to be fulfilled. When God says something has to happen, it has to happen. There's no option on it. There's no well, if this happens, that'll happen. Or if that happens, this will happen. It really is a scripture that has to be fulfilled because the scripture is God's word. And we can either accept it and just accept that even though in the pain of the moment, God's plan is bigger than us, or we can run away in denial. So let's take a look at the scripture. In verse 12, it starts out. Now, they had, they are, uh, you got to remember, the apostles are just coming off seeing Jesus ascended up into heaven. The angels have... I already spoken to them in verse 11. Now in verse 12, it says, now here's what they're going to do. 
They returned, they, then returned they unto Jerusalem, for the Mount, of Ol- Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So they are going from the Mount of Olives back to Jerusalem. How far was that? First and foremost, the significance of where they were. The Mount of Olives, or the Mount of Olivet, as it is said here, is very important. It is a very important physical location if you study end times prophecy, if you read the book of Zechariah and you study what is to come in the end times, you will see the Mount of Olives mentioned many times over and over. Zechariah 14.4 will give you a real specific inclination of just how important the Mount of Olives is in end times prophecy and Zechariah being written way before this account of the apostles was. But... Where was the Mount of Olives? It faced Jerusalem on the east. And from there, you can see a lot of things. You can see uh, what we call the Temple Mount, where the original temple was. Right now, as you would see the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives, what you would see is something that the Muslims call the Dome of the Rock that is built over top of the Temple Mount. But you can see the Temple Mount from the top of the Mount of Olives. You can also see the Kidron Valley. And it is a great view of, if you ever get to go there, they call it Old Jerusalem in tourist terms. But from the Mount of Olives, you can see Old Jerusalem. You see the historic sites that are listed here in Scripture. And this is where they were. They were up on the Mount of Olives and they were going to run down to Jerusalem. When the Scripture says a Sabbath day journey, there was a rule among you know, among the Jews that on the Sabbath, obviously you couldn't work, you couldn't do a lot of things, but one of the things was you, you couldn't travel, but so far. So when they say a Sabbath day journey, that is how far you can travel, how, how far Jews were allowed to travel on the Sabbath. And it estimates to about 0.6 miles, about a kilometer. So not the farthest, but it was literally as far as they could go on the Sabbath. So anyway, Verse 13, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotus and Judas, the brother of James. These are the 11 remaining the apostles because obviously one was missing and he's going to get mentioned in just a little bit. But these are the 11 remaining apostles. And when they say going to an upper room, what an upper room was, was you know, houses obviously back then were a lot different than ours. But an upper room of a house refers to the highest part of the house. It was typically built on a flat roof, on the flat roof. And it was another thing about these upper rooms is typically they were accessible by an outside source. They were accessible from outside the home. So Jesus and his disciples could come and go without disturbing the family downstairs. Otherwise, it'd probably get pretty inconvenient to just be going up and down the stairs and disturbing everybody of the house. This upper room, most likely, they could get to it without uh, disturbing the family inside. But that's just where they go. They go up into the upper room, and it is a disciple roll call with Dr. Luke, who writes the book of Acts. You see all the different apostles, the disciples, the 11 remaining that were present, and everybody is named except for, obviously, Judas Iscariot. Verse 14 These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So not only do we have the 11 disciples, but we also have the women. This is Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, uh, Salome, Joanna, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus' siblings. That includes James. That includes Jude. Um, James is the leader of the, he'll end up being the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Jude writes the book of Jude that's toward the back half of your New Testament before you get to Revelation. But this is everybody that's there. And it's amazing to see these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. It is hard enough to get five people in modern times to agree and go ahead in one accord. But these all continued in one accord because the accord that they were uh, you know, in unison on was something greater than anything could be. It was the living Savior. It was the Messiah. It was Christ. And they were all in one accord in this. They were all in the boat together, if you will. No one was pulling apart at any of the seams. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So this is everybody that's gathered up. And now we get to the fun part. 
And in those days, verse 15, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Simon Peter, the man that God said, the man that Jesus said, I will build my church upon this faith. He has, uh, he's renamed into Peter and it is who Jesus is going to build his church upon, his faith. And in, the, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. He took action. This is who is speaking. Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120 or so. So there's a pretty good number of people gathered up here. And verse 16 is where it's going to get complicated because you got you to gotta believe that still at this time, the disciples are still a little bit, you know, they've gone through seeing Jesus killed. They've seen him resurrected. They've had time with him, but now he's left. You know, now he has ascended. And they're, they're wondering when he's going to come back. Is he going to come back tomorrow? Is he going to come back the next day? Is he going to come back next year? How long do we have before Jesus comes back? And Simon Peter is going to say probably the thing that's going to, is, is going to cut them to the core the most because you got to imagine there had to be anger directed toward Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was counted among them. He was with them. He was the man that was, he had the, the power of the purse. He was the person that was controlling all the money and, and he was with them. He was going out with them on, on missions and he was with them through everything right up until the end. He is at the last supper. He is fed bread by Christ before he goes and betrays him and turns him over to those that seek to arrest him. So he's, he's with them right up until the end. And he, you know, scripture talks about the, the, the grief and the sorrow that he had, but he's, it doesn't take back what he did. But Simon Peter puts it plainly. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Another way of putting that is the scripture had to be fulfilled. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. Reminds us of what Judas did. But Peter says the scripture must be fulfilled. The scripture had to be fulfilled because through the fulfilling of of prophecy, God shows himself. God shows himself in many different ways. He shows himself through creation. He shows himself through his son. He shows himself through the Holy Spirit. He shows himself through the law written on the hearts of those that don't even believe in God. When they have God's law written on their heart, it's a way that God shows himself. And one of the ways he shows himself here is the fulfillment of prophecy, the fulfillment that this had to happen, that a betrayal had to happen. Jesus had to be betrayed. The other 11 weren't going to do it. They were faithful followers. They weren't going to do it. And the Jews, they needed somebody to turn coat. Someone had to be that guy. Someone was going to be that guy. The scripture had to be fulfilled. In Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 26, Jesus says it like this. If you think fulfilling scripture is a little bit inconvenient. Jesus said to the two witnesses on the road to Emmaus, he said to them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Prophecy, so much of the Old Testament are books of prophecy. Isaiah Jeremiah, all the minor prophets toward the back of your Old Testament, they all speak prophecy and they all speak of different times and different things that are to come, but they are not men speaking. They are God speaking through men and their prophecy has to be fulfilled. God bats a thousand. God cannot be wrong on anything. And so far he is batting a thousand and he is going to continue to bat a thousand with what is to come. But it's one of the major ways that God reveals himself. It is through the fulfillment of prophecy. I'll give you a small example. You, you might think, well, prophecy is a little bit complicated. How about this prophecy? How about God telling Noah that he is going to flood the earth and that he needs to build a boat. He needs to build it this high. He needs to build it this wide because animals are going to be gathered in it. Get your family rather ready because a rain is coming that will flood the earth. Prophecy fulfilled. The rains come, they flood, just like God told Noah. And he's sitting in the boat, not sitting there thinking, boy, I sure was smart to build that boat. No, thank God 
Thank God, I am thankful that God gave me this holy instruction and told me this prophecy of what was to come because prophecy has to be fulfilled. It's how God reveals himself. It's one of the ways God reveals himself. It's not the only way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, Paul hammers this home. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The New Testament is not written by the time the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians. When he says scriptures, he is referring to the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament. That is what he's referring to. According to the scriptures. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It was all said by God before it happened so that children of God could see that he was right. Once again, God has revealed himself through fulfilling this prophecy that the Messiah would have to die for the atonement of men's sins. It has to be fulfilled no matter how inconvenient. Now, let's get real specific. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Back to verse 16. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. How on earth would King David, all those years before, how on earth would King David know what was going to happen in his human-sized brain? He doesn't know who Judas Iscariot is apart from anybody. He's never going to meet him physically. He's not going to see the Messiah. He has been told by Samuel that further down the line, a Messiah will come, but he never is going to see these people face to face in his earthly life. How does he know this? Psalm 41, 9, this is where the words of David, the words of God through David speak to it. Psalm 41, 9. Yea, mine old familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. I'm going to read that again. He is referring to the person that would be Judas Iscariot. Yea, my own familiar friend. Was Judas a familiar friend of Christ? Yes, he was. He was one of his disciples. Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted. In whom I trusted. Which did eat of my bread at the Last Supper. He has bread put in his mouth by Christ, by Jesus. Eats of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. There's no way David in his own mind knows the events of what are going to happen that lead to the crucifixion of Christ. The only way it is recorded is because it was not David in his own mind recording this in the Psalms. It was the word of God through the man. The word of God through the man. It's the only way. It's the word of God and is the fulfillment of prophecy. It would be a friend of Jesus. It would not be the Romans. It would not be the Pharisees. The betrayal would come from within. Mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted would betray Jesus. Psalms are written way long before the accounts of the Gospels. But the scripture, the prophecy has to be fulfilled. The scripture must needs have been filled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. And another part of it, talking about real life, uh, talking about here and now prophecy, not just prophecy that's far off. In all four gospel accounts, you find multiple times over and over that Jesus tells the disciples what's going to happen, that he is going to be betrayed and he is going to be crucified. He tells them three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in the gospel account according to John, he tells them even more. But they don't, they don't heed it. They don't, they don't take it in. They don't process it. They're, they're seeing so many blessings. They are getting so much from Jesus' ministry. I mean, who would want to see it? If you're sitting there having a dandy time at Disneyland, riding all the rides you want, who wants to hear that the park closes in an hour? They don't want to hear that. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to hear when Jesus spoke to them saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered up and he is going to be crucified. They didn't want to hear these things, but Jesus said it to them and it was recorded in all four gospel accounts. Verse 17, 
gets even more inconvenient. For he was numbered with us. Talking about Judas. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. This was not some person that just appeared at a few of Jesus' sermons. This was not some back row Baptist at the Mount of the Sermon on the Mount. This was one of the disciples, one of the trusted guys from within the inner circle. And Jesus picked him. Jesus picked him specifically. In John chapter 6, verses 70 and 71, long before we even get to where he's he's crucified. John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. That's John chapter 6. Way before we get to the end of John's gospel account. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus handpicked him. Matthew 6, 21. Why did he pick him? How did he know? Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. How many times have we heard that man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside? Jesus is God, and he knows the inside. He knows the desires of their hearts, and he knows Judas's heart. He doesn't have to ask him a question. He doesn't have to have him fill out a questionnaire. He knows Judas's heart. And he knows where Judas's heart is, is in the money. That's where his heart is. That's why Judas gets offended when money is brought in or, or money is, is, is spent out or something else. Anything concerning money, you see Judas all up in arms and a little bit nervous and upset. 30 pieces of silver, all it took to betray his heart because that's where his love was. His love was in the money. It was greed. But Jesus doesn't have to sit there. Jesus is not sitting there surprised by this. He knows his heart and he picks him anyway. He picks him anyway. Then verse 17, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. And that's just the fulfillment of this prophecy. The fulfillment of the prophecy that someone would betray Jesus. At the time, who would ever think someone would betray somebody who is performing healings and he is making the blind to see and he is showing mercy. When someone is condemned to be stoned to death, he is showing mercy upon them and he is healing lepers and he's doing these amazing things. Who would ever think somebody would betray him? Prophecy would tell you he is going to be betrayed. He is going to be crucified because it is his death that is going to atone for sins. It is inconvenient. It is, it is not fun to sit there and think about, but it is just the truth that prophecy must be fulfilled because it is God's word. That's why you have to be very careful about false prophets because false prophets come promising things that are not going to happen The only place you look to prophecy is in Scripture, in God's Word, because only God knows what's going to happen and only God knows what's coming forward. And as we see, we look through Scripture, we see a lot of different prophecy that is still to be fulfilled. There's three different kinds of prophecy in the Bible. There's prophecy that has been fulfilled. There's prophecy that is being fulfilled. It's in the process of being fulfilled. And there's prophecy that is to be fulfilled. An example of that would be a lot of the things in the book of Revelation, the return, the second coming of Christ. Matthew chapter 24 sure paints a, a pretty good picture for us of things that are coming. This is an example of prophecy. These are uh, God speaking forward rather on things. If I, can, you know, if I was a good pastor, I would have tabbed that verse, uh, tabbed that set of scripture. Matthew 24, I'll just run through a few of the things. Because the disciples asked him, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That part about many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. Made me think about the Branch Davidians out in Waco, Texas in the 1990s. The leader that they were following that got them all killed. What was he proclaiming? He was proclaiming that he was Christ. Got his people killed for it. Got most of them killed for it. Women, children, and other men. Got them killed for it. An example of a false prophet. Someone coming saying that they are the Christ. 
Continuing on, another part in verse 7. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. In verse 10, there shall be many offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. False prophets are out there. They are working. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and then shall come, and then shall the end come. We don't know when it's coming, but we know what's going to be a part of it. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be horrible leading up to it. And a lot of people have gotten the prediction wrong. There were people in Civil War times, the most deadly war in the United States history. Every death was an American. They thought the end of times were there. They were seeing death like none other. They were looking out into their tobacco fields and their wheat fields, and they were seeing bodies just litter, and they thought they were in the end times. And in that time, many false prophets were rising up trying to tell them, you are in the end times right now. It is coming. Look at all this death here. And they were led astray by false prophets. Still happens to this day. Happens to this day. You'll see a ton of false prophets. Watch next time a natural disaster happens. You'll see plenty of false prophets rise up. They're still working in the land. They are still here because they are seeking to deceive souls. They are seeking to deceive souls. But the truth of the matter is, as I said this morning, again, only the Father knows when Jesus will return. I caution you, anytime, if if it's you or a family member or a friend, if they are under somebody's preaching that is trying to give them some exact date spit out, of when this is going to come. Well, it's coming in, in, in 2025. It's coming in 2026. It's coming in, you know, insert the date. Get them as far away from that teaching and that preaching as they can because you have somebody that thinks that they've got the mind of God enough where they know something that they don't know. What Scripture says they do not know. They do not know when Christ is coming back. Only God does. Only God the Father does. All it starts off is with that. Then it turns into small things. They can lie to you about anything. What is it? They're under the control of Satan. And who is Satan? He is the father of lies. They can spit there and spit out lies left and right. So you need to be ready. You need to be on the lookout for this stuff. Only the Father knows when Jesus will return. But we are to be prepared. Because as we know, as we study the end times, as we study Revelation, and we look through these things... It sounds awful. It looks awful. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible under the influence of the Antichrist. It's going to be all kinds of awful things. But you can see through Scripture, through the Old Testament, and going forward, that every prophecy by God is either been fulfilled, is being fulfilled, or is going to be fulfilled. And you know God batting a thousand, God never getting anything wrong, we know what is coming. We know a time of sorrow is coming. We know these things. God has given us this knowledge through his word left behind for us that we know this is coming. And it is inconvenient. It is an inconvenient truth. It's like anybody that's ever, anybody that's been to a funeral lately. Does scripture not say from dust you were formed and to dust you shall return? We know death is a part of life. But it is sure inconvenient at the funeral home. It is sure inconvenient at the graveside. It's not fun and it's not pretty. It's not some enjoyable thing. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life was when I preached my first funeral. It was awful. I just, I just, I mean, I was honored to do it. Don't get me wrong, but it was hard to stand up there and, and keep a straight face and not cry. But all I got to do is look at the Word of God, and I know it's coming. And that's just what God's Word says about my life let alone get into what's coming in the end times. It's not a lot of fun that's coming for the unbeliever, for the lost soul, for the one that is defiant of God, for the one who refuses to accept salvation. It is bad times coming. It's bad times now. It's worse times coming for the lost, for the deceived, for the one who has turned his back on God completely. There's there's really bad stuff coming. We know what comes in the end. There's worse that comes through prophecy. We know what God is going to do with unbelievers. We have that knowledge. We should not tote that knowledge 
as something to stand upon and say, well, I'm better than you. We should tote it as the greatest warning ever given. There's warnings on, seems like every single product you buy in a store, right? There's, there's a warning on everything. They got a warning on coffee cups at McDonald's that say it's hot. We have the warning from God that judgment will be poured out upon unbelievers. And there is judgment to be poured out upon lukewarm Christians. You are neither hot or cold. Revelation says, I will spit you out of my mouth, says God's word about the lukewarm Christian. I will spit you out of my mouth. His word says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's disgusting. It's what God's word says. It's what God says. It's what God has revealed through his scripture. He does not reveal it to just be some mean, angry God. He reveals it because he loves us enough that we know the truth. He loves us enough that we would know what is coming and what is the truth. If I see you, if I see a a, a friend of mine who is married with a couple of kids and I see him sneaking around doing something he's not supposed to do with somebody that's not his wife. It is not loving for me to sit there and enable that man and say, man, boy, Hattie, this one's better than the last one. This one's better than the one you got at home. No, loving him is telling him, brother, God hates divorce and your adultery can lead to divorce. That's what God's word says. So don't sit there and continue on. If I love you, I'm not going to let you sit there and continue on. I'm going to love you enough to tell you the truth. And I hope you love me enough to tell me the truth. Because if you don't love me enough to tell me the truth, I don't think you love me at all. I think you just want to enable me. You want to just be my buddy. I got enough buddies. And I got enough friends. And the ones I do count as buddies and friends, I love them enough that I want them to be honest with me. See me going astray, astray, say something. Let me know if I don't see it. If I seem awful proud about it, say something. If you saw me riding down the road with a flat tire, I'd hope you'd flash your lights and wave at me so that I wouldn't go get on 220 and get in a crash and die. Loving someone is being honest with them, giving them that gentle rebuke. The world doesn't see it that way. But I pull it all back to this, because back even to this inconvenient part, That the scripture is going to be fulfilled. The prophecy is going to be fulfilled. What God's word says is going to be fulfilled. It is a hard teaching. It is not a very fun teaching. But it is an important teaching to know. That God does not blow off prophecy. He does not sit there and just pick and choose. Well, I'll fulfill a few and that will be good and dandy. He's batting 100%. He's shooting 100%. He's not missing. Because he's in control. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He's all powerful. He's not being replaced. There's nobody in competition with him. Everybody that thinks they're in competition with him is a liar. They are anti Christ. And his word will be fulfilled, and his judgment will be poured out. And it is important for us to go forward in this knowledge and know it is going to be fulfilled. We need to be busy. We need to be having those difficult conversations. And we need to be willing. And when you have them, and I'll, I'll close with this. When you have them, what you need to be reminded of is that you don't go forward in your own feelings and in your own opinion. Your feelings and your opinions are as fickle as your heart. They can sway and turn with the watch of something on TV. You could thought one thing, see something on TV, and be like, well, no, I think the other thing. Base them And have them grounded in the word of God. And if they turn away from that word of God, that's on them. But the word of God is the authority. It is the only authority. Go forward in the word of God to them. Don't go forward in feelings. Don't go forward in thoughts. Don't go forward in opinions. Go forward in God's word. Because it is God's word that will be fulfilled. Many have come forward saying this is when the world's going to end. Al Gore is still probably making a killing off of telling people that the polar ice caps were going to burn off and in 20 years, back in 1999, we were going to be flooded out. It's 2023. Is Miami underwater? Are the Florida Keys flooded? Is the Outer Banks flooded? No. They're all 
piling up these doomsday prophecies, it makes them money. It makes them seem important. But if it don't line up with what the Word of God says, quite frankly, it really don't matter. And it's only there to deceive. Let's pray.